Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 41 of the Friday Nightmares podcast. On this episode, we are talking about Airbnb rental horror films. I am one half of the hosting team this evening, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, waxed, and ready to climax, and if you can please get me wet and feed me after midnight. <laughs> and with me, as always, is... Heather Powell, coming to you today from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. I have such a boring intro compared to Scott. <laughs> Mine is like, so like, I like horror movies and I come from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um here we are mid-september man the movies are coming out fast and furious <laughs> and uh-huh. it's funny because <laughs> fast and furious came out this year too um but there's been a lot of really good 2021s dropped recently i'm so excited to see some theatrical releases that are coming out i have managed to avoid the halloween trailer thank you for your warning scott yay when i went to see Candyman which I thoroughly enjoyed quite a bit. Um, for the people out there that are saying this movie's too political, did you close your eyes and plug your ears during the first one? <laughs> right. I'm a little confused how you don't understand that the first one was about genderfic- genderfication too and also about racism. I, I don't get right. how you didn't get that. <laughs> like, when I heard, when I seen those complaints coming around, I was just like, uh, what? Um, did we watch the same movies? <laughs> like, and here's the thing. If you didn't like the candy main sequel which is what it was it's a sequel um that's fine you don't have to like it like if it wasn't your jam and absolutely like totally get it but to say that it was too political when the first one was political and if you right. like the first one like i don't know pick or choose i guess which politics you like but they're talking about the same politics yeah there's just a little bit more about pr- police brutality in this one but this is also taking place in chicago and yeah. for anyone who can read newspapers or well, I guess newspapers aren't even around anymore, but Google news or anything else would understand that I, there's racial crimes everywhere, but there's certain population groups in certain places that are targeted the most. Um, so I don't know. I thought it was a great film. And anyway, I am super glad that you warned me because I was able to remove myself from the Halloween trailer, though who I went with said that the trailer looked fucking awesome. And now he wants to go <laughs> Halloween Hills. So, you know, obviously it must be a good trailer because it definitely, um, he's a, a medium horror fan. We'll say, yeah. you know, he likes the big blockbusters and he likes a lot of sci-fi horror and stuff like that, but he's not going to watch the shit. This guy <laughs> no, not many do. <laughs> Well, even some of the stuff when our in our recent 2021 watches, like I don't think he would like that. And to be honest with you, there's a couple on our 2021 watches that I don't think, unless you're a really avid horror fan, you would enjoy. Um, yeah. personally, but I, yeah, he's pumped, so it looks good. Um, yeah. And speaking of pumped, by the time everyone hears this, I should hopefully be packing my shit and heading <laughs> over to see you yeah oh my goodness like so yeah so we are recording this on the sunday prior to scott coming up on the friday so scott will be releasing if you are listening to this you're listening to it on thursday night or maybe early friday morning because you know we we sure that that's the first thing everyone does when our episode comes out is they (laughs) download it and listen to it because we're tray important but yes um yeah so scott will be driving what time are you planning on leaving scotty have you thought about that yet providing you get a negative covid test on wednesday because that's what we're really hanging all our hopes on Yep, I was gonna say, yeah, we're just waiting on that test. I'm trying to keep my hopes slow because I mean, the test could get, come back positive, even though mm-hmm. I'm not showing symptoms because I could yeah. be asymptomatic. You never yeah. know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so once we get that negative COVID test, that's when the hype train will start building. Uh, but I'm thinking I'll probably leave, or try to get up and leave around like nine in the morning because then I yeah. can get out there by like one ish. Yeah, I would, I would recommend between eight and nine for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, it allows you to get here, get here. I'm so used to coming back from your place so many years ago, <laughs> right. like literally years ago now. Yeah. Um, that that's crazy, Scotty years ago. Yeah. Years ago. When I say that, that I drove back from Michigan. Years not ago. Lack, it's not lack of trying. Just, no, 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 just no option. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
but um anyway yeah so it's it's a fair journey it's it's 352 kilometers which i think scotty said is what 230 miles something like that yeah something like that so it's it's a distance plus you got across borders and scott has to have a whole bunch of paperwork um prepared at least he can download it all on an app which makes it a little bit easier i assume that he just shows the border guard and the border guard will go through it and you know grant their blessing for him to cross over but um yeah hopefully all goes to plan because i bought uh, a lot of booze yes you um, did. <laughs> i went and bought a lot of weed yesterday so. <laughs> Um, and I plan on cooking some yum yum food and uh, doing some fun stuff. We may not do nightmares, disclaimer. And the reason why is because I have found out that you have to crawl through parts of it. And I'm concerned about Scotty's back. Uh, Scott yeah. has a bad back and we don't want Scott pulling his back and then having to drive um, home. So we'll see. We might do another haunted house in Niagara Falls. We will for sure do the 4D zombie ride. I've already check that out and it looks like it's a really fun interactive ex- experience with shooting zombies nice. um but yeah we'll see we'll see what he's feeling up to by the time he gets here so. yeah because i literally threw my back out two weeks ago and it's finally getting to the point where it's almost fully healed so may not be the best to try to strain it again right away well especially when you have to drive back in a car for four yeah. hours like it would be different if it was around your area and all you had to do is drive home for 20 minutes and then you could right. rest, right? But when you're in another country and <laughs> you have to commute home and you have to go home for work, it's not like you can just stay here and mooch off the Canadian healthcare system. Damn it, I you, wish I could. <laughs> you, have to, you have to go home. So, um, and we're hoping that, you know, Dave C, we let Dave C know as well that from Exploding Heads that uh, Scotty will hopefully be here, but a COVID test is quite expensive to get um i think scotty's test that the canadian government requires is about 130 yeah it's anywhere between 130 and 150 um yeah. and the only place that does this test near me is an hour away so i gotta i'm taking the morning off on wednesday for work so i can go out there get the test get the results because they get to give you the results within a half hour and then i'll be driving straight back and going to work so it's it's a lot we don't know if Dave will be able to do that simply because, A, it's a lot of money for an evening. We would only be seeing Dave on the Friday. Um, and that's a lot to ask of somebody to, yeah. <laughs> to do. Uh, so, But he will be seeing Christian from Exploding Heads. Hell yeah, I will. If he does come over. Uh, Christian is well aware that Scott is joining me. And Christian only lives 15 minutes away from me. So it's a nice little quick drive over. And hopefully we'll see Vince as well from TGIF 13 Family Fan uh, Friday Fan Podcast. Yeah, that'd be um, sweet. He might come out to the drag show with us on Saturday night. So we're he'll get to meet hopefully at least one podcaster. So yep. well, two technically, since I'll be meeting you again. I, I guess, but you've already you've already met me. I know, <laughs> but it'll be changed that much, Scott. <laughs> but it'll be like meeting you again for the first time. <laughs> oh no, it won't be because I'll be way more like rude to you and I'll be like complaining <laughs> that you took too long to get there. And, That's what I'm saying. Like I'll be like, I'll be shed. meeting you for the first time again because before you were all nice and polite to me. And... Oh yeah, it's not like that now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Be prepared to be Raz literally all weekend. Uh, I can't like, wait. It's just going to be me bullying you and my friends being like, stop being so mean to Scott. <laughs> I I'll love be it. Like, he deserves it, guys. He deserves it. So, yeah. So, that's why we chose this topic. Um, not because Scott stayed in an Airbnb. I am kind enough to let him stay in my home. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but we just thought of travel horror and, you know, some really great movies recently came out that talk about Airbnb and yeah, what, why not this topic? Um, yeah. Travel horror, as we start, the world starts opening up again. Um, you know, for some places like Florida, it's never closed. They closed for 50 seconds and then they opened again. <laughs> right. Right. So for a lot of other places, though, they're just getting back into traveling and using Airbnbs and rentals and stuff. So that's why we chose this topic. So it'll be a fun little thing to talk about before hopefully Scotty's trip happens. And we say hopefully because we like to be realistic, but everyone will know um, and if and when Scott gets here because we will go live throughout the weekend. Yes. Sometimes talking about cool shit, like if we go to Niagara Falls and we go in a haunted house or something like that. And sometimes that's just being drunk at a drag show and me just trying to embarrass Scott. Like it will be a mixture of you know, really thoughtful, smart live videos and just, you know, train wrecks. So buckle up, everyone. <laughs> either way, 
either way, it should be entertaining. <laughs> it should be entertaining for sure. So we'll get into our, our movies. Um, I guess this first one, did you watch this one, Scotty? Or does it just me who watched this one? Uh, it is just you that's watched this one so far. I remember you thought it was like, I remember your thoughts on it. So I want to check it out. Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. So this movie is called The Stairs. Uh, Brandon Orlick from the Exploding Heads movie podcast mentioned it to me. Um, hence, I checked it out. I'm just trying to look it up in my my uh, letterbox here. Here we are. So it's a 92 minute runtime. It's definitely an independent film. I would say they use their budget reasonably well for it. It's a film that takes place between two time periods. Um, at the beginning, it takes place in 1997. A little boy goes missing when he finds a set of stairs in the woods. And then 20 years later, a group of hikers go into the same woods um, and they also encounter the stairs and the other um, entities that come with the stairs. So it's available on Google, Voodoo, Microsoft Store, Hoopla, and YouTube. For a low budget film, I think it's entertaining enough. Do I think it's a must watch for this year? Probably not. But I would say if you enjoy um, The Ritual that came out on Netflix a couple of years ago, you may enjoy this film. Um, And and you have to have a little bit of a taste for lower budget. You know, there's some really good makeup effects in this film. For a film that obviously didn't have a lot of money, their makeup effects were bang on. Jason Gray, I believe. um, Yes, Jason, right? Yeah. Yeah, he knows the people, I think, that made this film or knows the makeup artist. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he mentioned something on our post. Hey, Jason. Um, I, I really thought the makeup in this was really, really well done. And I give the makeup artist a lot of credit for what they worked with. And the acting was fairly decent as well, too. Like, this is a really good little low budget film. I just don't know if it's going to be for everybody. But if you enjoy Hindi horror, you like movies like The Ritual, I would suggest checking this out. I think it's a cool concept. And it's a lot of fun. Definitely worth a $199 to $399 rental if what I talked about sounds like your jam. Nice. Yeah, this is one I will definitely uh, try to watch here in the coming weeks. Because, yeah, mm-hmm. It definitely sounded very, uh, like, an interesting concept. Yeah, it doesn't overstay its time. You know, at 92 minutes, it's an appropriate runtime. Um, the ending drags out a little bit, but you know what? You're going to have that all the time with films. You're always going to have a little bit of a drag with some movies, right. right? So the next one, have you seen this one, or is this me again? This is you again. Uh, it looks like two, then me, two, then me, two, then me. Almost. Okay, okay. So this one is called The Old Ways. It's been released on Netflix, I'm sure, for anyone here who's... Uh, an avid Netflix seeker. Um, It's a 90 minute runtime. It's basically about a journalist who is from Mexico, who travels to her ancestral home in search of answers about sorcery and healing. And she gets mixed up in a situation where people assume that she is possessed. So it's a very interesting journey down with what the main character is dealing with in her life when it comes to her own personal demons, mixed with the demons that are perceived to be invading in her. It's it's a very well-made film. And I think for Netflix, for a free watch, you can't go wrong. Um, at a 90-minute runtime, it doesn't overstay. It's welcome. It is definitely entertaining. Um, I know Tim Davis from uh, Horror for Dummies gave this four stars. And I think that's a really fair oh, wow. rating. The acting is really good. The The movie moves along quickly. The, the production value is very high. Did I love the story? Yeah, I, I thought it was okay. I liked how it kind of kept you guessing to what was real and not real, but definitely a solid film. And with a Netflix watch, you can't go wrong. And I think there's some people out there that will really enjoy this. Uh, Dave C., I know that no one has said, quote unquote, that uh, there's any must check out watches this year. I don't know if I would put this as a much, much, much checked out watch, but I think I would recommend it to you as something that you may enjoy. And it's for free and it's on Netflix and it's called The Old Ways. Yeah, once again, this is this is the one I actually added to my watch list because I talked to you and Brandon about it. Nice. Yeah, Brandon, I think, enjoyed it as well. Yeah, he did. Um, and yeah, like the next one, I think I only seen, correct? Yeah, I haven't seen this one. All right. So this one, speaking of Brandon Orlick, he recommended this one to us. Uh, it is called Digging to Death. Uh, this is available on Apple iTunes, Google Play, Vudu, and Amazon Prime. Uh, it's basically a story about a man who moves into a house and discovers a box buried in his backyard filled with $3 million and a fresh corpse. He tries to hide the money in the house only to be stalked by the buried body. Uh, this is, once again, a very low-budget uh, horror film, but I found this to be done like really well. The ma- its main focus is on this guy that's getting a divorce. 
and just kind of like his way of it's basically a film about him coping with everything and just like this money kind of drives him to madness with the way this ghost keeps messing with him and i thought the main performance from this actor or the performance from this main actor was really well done you can see him being just like a normal guy kind of descending into madness as it goes on and yeah just for such a low budget film i thought this was just a very well done uh well done and just really well thought out the way it plays out it's well paced and like it yeah i i recommend this one i think it i won't think it's good i don't think it'll be anyone's top 10 but i still think this is still uh once again a year of indie horror yeah. and this is one to definitely check out man indie horror and we say indie i think people think it's rinkety dinkety shit it's not yeah you know when scott and i say indie horror it's not like people filming it on their iphone like this is this is quality filmmaking and if we're recommending it, it means that it's a film that's not going to have the blockbuster effects that like Candyman does, or right. um, I'm trying to think, or Spiral, or something like that. It's not going to have the over the top big name actors or anything like that, but it's going to be a good solid film. Look at the stylist that came out earlier this yes. year. Very solid, good film. Not a lot of gore in it, actually, but it was the creepiness of who the killer was in that and how they were able to get away with it that was creepy. Because yeah. all of us go and get our hair cut at some point. Right, exactly. Right? And you're vulnerable because that person has scissors and other such things, other weapons that they could use. And I think that's when we talk about indie horror, you know, I, I think people sometimes label it in a certain way and it's and it's not that way. I, I think it's important that people open up their minds and realize that we've moved past the Blair Witch projects, which don't get me wrong, Blair Witch when it came out was great. But if we look at the production value that indie horror has now, it's it's higher. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, there's still some that are lower quality, but they absolutely. are still like and we got one that we'll be talking about later that yeah, like definitely does that. Does it super well. Yeah. So anyway, um, the next one is a Hindi film as well, and it's called Stoker Hill. Uh, Tony Todd's in this one. Tony oh, really? Todd was the big thing that they got for this film. And it's basically, it's a 91 minute film and it starts off as found footage and then it kind of moves into a theatrical movie. It's a really interesting concept. Uh, it starts off with three students filming a horror movie and they stumble upon something much worse. And it's very much a layered of like, here's this found footage, people finding the found footage, people choosing to do something with the found footage. Like it's definitely a very, very layered film. It has a 2.7 rating on Letterboxd. Um, no one that we know has watched it. It's uh, it's just me who's watched it so far. Oh, wow. <laughs> that in our community, at least that I'm friends with on Letterboxd. Uh, but I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good little mix of found footage and in person. Do I think it's the best film of the year? No. Um, but did I find it a nice little mix of two different di types of genres or filmmaking come together? Absolutely, I did. And it's available nowhere. That's probably why no one's watched it yet. Oh. So I must have seen a screener. So it's, this comes available. I would recommend it on Google Play, Apple iTunes, uh, definitely anywhere between a $199 and $399 rental. I would say maybe Shutter will pick this up. It looks like something that Shutter might pick up because Shutter picks up different shit. Yeah, like Shutter, you can't really predict what Shutter will get. No, um, you cannot. I watched a very low budget indie film last year about the couple that goes away, and it turns out the dude is not who he seems to be. Yeah, what was the name of that? I can't remember. It was a relationship film. Yep. And it was pretty low budget, and I didn't think Shutter was going to pick it up, and they did. So it really is interesting what shutter will pick up so i could see this definitely being a shutter watch in which case you know watch it because it's free why wouldn't you if you have shutter uh if you like found footage and then kind of a switch over to a different kind of filming and you want to just see how this movie was made and maybe get some ideas for your own film i would re i would recommend it as a 199 to 399 rental when it's dropped nice yeah i because uh yeah i think i remember you mentioning this one as well like yeah it's entertaining character. All right, the next one is on Shudder, and this is what I mean by weird fucking shit that Shudder picks up. <laughs> so this is called Mosquito State. It's a 100-minute runtime. Um, it's basically about an isolated Wall Street dataless guy who developed a software system based on the concept of bees and hives. No longer is that system functioning the way it should. And it decides to switch over to more of, a, he decides to have mosquitoes 
and uses mosquitoes as his inspiration. Hmm. Um, It's a very much an artistic film. I really dug it till I got close to the ending. The ending was extremely confusing for me. They tried to do this real artistic ending. I'm not quite sure what the ending was, but it's supposed to be fairly deep. Uh, It's got a 2.6 rating on Letterboxd. Not a lot of people have watched it. It's, if you like very abstract artistic films, this film is for you. It is very, very character development heavy. A lot of dialogue, um, not a lot horror happening at all. Just a lot of creepiness and slow descent into madness. If that sounds like something that works for you, then I would watch it. It's a hundred minute runtime. And if you got Shudder, it's available on all the Shudders as well as AMC um, Plus. Nice. Yeah, this is one I was, I seen on Shudder, but didn't really intrigue me from what I was reading the synopsis. I don't think, knowing your taste, Scotty, I don't think you'll miss anything by skipping this one. Okay. I don't, I think you'll be like, I, I think if you really like abstract artistic films, this is a good film. But like the ending just is very much like, oh, look at artistic and deep this is. <laughs> we don't really know what's happening. So if that's what you dig, it's great. But yeah, I, I for you, I would say, no, don't worry about it. All right. Good to know. Um, yeah, so I'll just jump into the next one, which uh, this one is actually going to be in our main topic as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is also a Shutter exclusive. It is called Superhost, and it's about these two video bloggers that are YouTube stars, basically, that go to different Airbnbs. They're a married couple or a couple, and they go to these Airbnbs and basically interview the host of the Airbnb and kind of give them a rating and whatnot, which, of course, you know, if you're a super popular YouTube person, your ratings, if you rate it high, would give this... uh, Airbnb a lot of popularity and success and if you rate it poorly it will pretty much ruin that person's career yeah, yeah. and but yeah they get the they get to this Airbnb and they meet up with the host who is very eccentric oh man over the top the eccentric yeah. yes we'll get more into it in our spoilers but yeah yeah uh, but I thought this was a uh, pretty fun film uh, it does have a uh, brief appearance with uh, Barbara Crampton as well yeah, um, yeah, she's in it for like 50 seconds. She yeah. did for the role she's in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought what she did was f- perfectly fine. And yeah, like I I thought this was fun. Uh, the two main characters, especially the uh, main female character, super annoying and unlikable to me. Oh yeah, totally. But that is these type of YouTube personality vloggers. They have mm-hmm. that over the top, just kind of annoying personalities mm-hmm. in the first place. Mm-hmm. 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 So it works for the film, but good lord that you can be a chore to well we'll get to that more but <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah I, I say this one is definitely like if you have shutter it's definitely worth checking out i think it's a well done film all the acting is done really well and it's uh definitely makes you just go what the fuck's going on yeah i agree i think the uh i think the concept is just really well done the way they explore airbnb and we'll talk about that more in our spoilers but i think this is a great modern day horror film i think it takes something that's really popular in society and and puts a real good spin on it of what could happen you never know where you're really staying and i think this movie really emphasizes that so i agree for a free watch on shutter you can't go wrong yeah exactly now do you want to introduce this bad boy or should i bring it in Oh, let's see. I can do this one. All, All right. right. Please do. The best, best 2020. It's actually Scott and I's number one film. Every award is going to go to this film this year. Totally. So, so good. So <laughs> we are talking about John Wick. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, don't breathe too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one, I, as you can tell from our reaction, we have uh, mixed feelings on because this film is basically focused on the blind man as the protagonist question mark <laughs> and which is really weird if you've watched the first film um but he which is hit, really great that he avoided getting like murder charges and in pregnant and you know impregnating that other woman and yeah. hanging her up in the basement and now he's just chilling with this kid so it's all good <laughs> yeah because yeah somehow he has a kid that he's teaching survival to and all this and <laughs> then these other people find uh i guess see this girl and follow her back to the house and basically all hell breaks loose and it becomes this crazy over the top like action film 
with so many flaws and plot holes. And like I, when I joked earlier, it reminded me of a low rent John Wick, just not done well. Cause yeah, the blind man can do some crazy super powered type action style abilities. And it's just, it's so fucking ridiculous. Now, I will give this credit. Steve Lang takes good fucking care of himself because yes. he's ripped. <laughs> oh, he absolutely is. And he's a good actor. He is. You know what? Steve Lang is fine in this. And Brandon Sexton the uh, third, who played in Empire Records as the guy that kept being sugar high. Oh, yeah. Is in this film. Oh, yeah. Um, only as an older, obviously, he's older now. And I enjoyed him. I thought he was, his character was good. And he was like a creepy asshole. Uh, the little girl did fine. You know, the acting in this wasn't the problem. No. You know, the main actors did fine for what the movie was. It was the horrible plot development <laughs> that made zero sense. And I will yeah. just say this is a spoiler. I never knew that cooking meth was such an ex- like a, a limited skill set that only a few people knew how to do and that they had to be kept alive at all costs to cook the meth. I had no idea for the amount of meth that people do, that there's only a few people that are trained in that art. Maybe they should right. call it's program, How to Cook yeah. Meth. <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly. Um, and it was just, you know, and, I, and we'll get into our older films where I watched the first one. I actually watched the first one and then I watched the second one, uh, which you don't need to do, by the way. Yeah. Um, you're actually better off to just not watch either. Um, like, <laughs> no, the first one's better. I'll say this one. The first one's better. The second one, like there was some cool fight scenes in it and there was some creepy scenes where the girl's trying to escape the kidnappers but the plot was just so full of holes and just so ridiculous that it just made zero sense yeah um it reminded me of like an 80s action film where it's just like okay this is entertaining but it makes no damn sense yeah like it's a 98 minute runtime the ending is completely ridiculous it's it's you know and oh the end the, the last little bit is this is the worst like i don't know who wrote this fucking movie but it was fucking dumb but yeah anyway as you can tell scott and i don't overly recommend it even if you yeah. saw the first one and you really like the first one i don't think you're gonna like this one it isn't nearly as good as the first one and even the first one has some plot holes in it but like nothing compared to the swiss cheese that is this movie of yeah. holes. <laughs> like it's just ridiculous the whole entire but, time i'm just holding my head going what the fuck if for some reason you're like no no i gotta see for myself it is available on itunes google amazon microsoft store youtube and in canada as well you can rent it on cineplex um if you so f- if you should so choose to do that for some reason so yeah yeah eh. <laughs> i know we're both like meh, well you know and then i guess i'll get into you've seen this one too though haven't you nope this is the one i wanted to see but um, i haven't okay. had a chance to yet so this one is called wired shut also similar concept of don't breathe it's a 95 minute runtime basically it's about a guy who's a novelist and he lives in a remote mountain home. His daughter comes to visit him. They're estranged. And then a break-in occurs. And he has to fight to save him and his daughter. And his mouth is wired shut because he was in an accident. And for some reason, his mouth is wired shut. So <laughs> it's not a bad film. You know, for the concept of what it is, it's entertaining enough. We're not looking at a big cast here. There's only three characters in this entire film. Oh, okay. Um, it definitely is a lower budget. I won't say indie because it definitely has more money behind it. Uh, but it is a lower budget film. If you like break and enter films, like if you enjoy things like, uh, oh my goodness, You're Next, uh, Babysitter Must Die, a uh, bunch of other films like that, then you'll probably enjoy this film here. Uh, There is a little bit of a twist to it. You know, think better watch out twist kind of stuff. I guess that's a spoiler, but I don't know how many people are going to watch this. Um, There is some twists and turns to this film, but yeah, it's entertaining enough. I would say if you're going to uh, rent it, um, no more than $1.99 or $2.99 rental. Okay, because yeah, I love the I, the concept of this with the person that's uh, mouth is wired shut and just having to deal with this. That I thought that was really a neat concept. That's kind of why I wanted to see this. You know, when you talk about gremlins, I wish your mouth was wired shut. <laughs> <laughs> we could make a movie about you talking about gremlins and then I wire your mouth shut. Oh, just wait till we get to our uh, oh, dark segment. Oh, no. Why? Why? <laughs> 
All right. All, All right. right. So we got one more. And this I'm going to let you talk about because of your strong thoughts on it. All right. So the next film uh, or the final film of our 2021 segment is We Need to Do Something. And it's basically about this family that takes shelter inside of a bathroom uh, during a tornado. That is all I will say about the plot, because the less you know about this, the better, because this movie is a wild fucking ride. Um, And I will say this one does not. uh, You could watch the trailer because I watched the trailer afterwards and the trailer doesn't spoil anything, but it it just like just kind of gives you a lot of flashing images. Uh, But at the same time, yeah, this film fucking incredible the it's a very small cast it's a family of four so it's mother father son daughter and these four oh there's actors... one other there's one other person oh yeah that we see in flashbacks yes in flashbacks yes yeah but yeah the main focus is on the phone yeah. yeah but i gotta say the acting in this was out of this world um it is one of the most tense films i have seen this year um and has one of the, even Brandon said it, has one of the most scariest moments that just freaked me and him out so much that we almost poo pooed our pants. You guys are babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I got to give, this is like, this is low budget done really fucking well because it's. This is low budget, not even low budget. Yeah. Like you would, you would not known that this was a low budget film, except for the fact that they just chose to keep it simple. And even then there were some scenes that were actually quite elaborate. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like the makeup effects in this for some of the things that happen Mm -hmm. really well done. Um, And another thing I liked about this is this was filmed during quarantine. So, or during the lockdown and uh, was filmed on a soundstage in Michigan. So like that just gives, makes this even more like of a, like, if you know that going in, you may appreciate it even more because they literally just film it pretty much in one setting besides. And they flashbacks. were quarantined. Yeah. And they were in, yeah, quarantined. Yeah. And, and man, I loved everything about this film. This is one of my favorite films of the year now. Like, it actually may be my number one. Like, yeah, this that's how incredible. much I love this. Yeah. This is a must watch film. Yeah. Like, honestly, this is a must watch film. It has a 2.8 rating on Letterboxd. And I think that's because not a lot of people have seen it yet. Um, it's available on iTunes, it's available on Vudu, Microsoft Store, Spectrum On Demand, and DirecTV United States. It is worth what every rental you pay for this movie. It is a very, very well-acted, well-thought-out, um, creepy, subtly creepy film. And I think you're at a miss if you miss this movie this year. Absolutely. Like, this one uh, gives you the horror without actually showing a lot, which is... Absolutely. Real, which, if you can do that and make it come off that creepy and intense, then it is well fucking done. I couldn't agree more, Scotty. Absolutely. Uh, so, Scotty and I both recommend it. And that's a, that's our 2021 watches. We, uh, we actually watched a fair amount. So, that gives you guys something to look at while Scott and I are getting drunk next weekend. Yeah. Uh, older films, I... I already alluded to it. I put Don't Breathe on here from 2016. Um, I enjoyed it a lot more than the second one. I feel like the second one was just dumb. This, like the first one has some plot holes in it too. Like my thing that I I said to Scott and Brandon is, okay, so they get locked in the daughter's bedroom, the daughter that's dead. And there's bars on the window, so they can't get out of the windows. Flash forward five minutes later, he throws the guy through one of the windows that apparently had the bars on it Mm -hmm. five minutes ago. And the guy ends up on the, on the, um, Terrence where the where the glass roof is and I just was like well that makes no fucking sense and just little stuff like there were points where they could have run away but they didn't like where he shoots the pregnant woman that he has captured and he's grieving like why not just run up smash him in the face while he's screaming and then get the fuck out of there like there was just little things that I thought were a little silly but overall I would say it was an entertaining enough movie and I did definitely enjoy it enjoy it more than the second yeah, because I, I seen this one in theaters and then I, I really dug it back then. And after a few rewatches, it kind of went down a little bit. But I would say that first experience when you're going into it thinking that, uh, you know, the blind man is the victim in this. And then they do that twist later on, like, because you don't see it coming, like, when you originally see it, like, if no, you heard anything. No, no. And, like, when you find out what, what he's actually hiding in that house, it's just like, oh, shit. Okay, this this just turned like something completely different that I did not expect. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's, it's, it's like a great uh, home invasion gone wrong in that way. And Stephen Lang is great. And yet again, Stephen Lang, you know what? Send me some workout tips, dude, because you are <laughs> fucking like a beast. 
right? And I don't even know how old he is. Do we know how old he is? Uh, I can look real quick. Like, I feel like he's at least in his 70s. And he's and like, let's see here. I got it. I got his bio. He was born in 1952. Yeah, born 19... in 1952. Yeah, so he's 71. Like, good for him. Like, yeah, he looks good fucking for great. him. He's fucking ripped anyway um i think he i think he is the saving grace of this movie i think the main girl jane levy is pretty good too i mm-hmm. think uh she plays her role pretty well she was also an evil dead yes. twin peaks as well um so she's had a fair amount of experience with acting too so it's it's yeah i think definitely for 2016 it was a good film watching don't breathe and don't breathe Two back to back you really do see the quality difference yeah um, you know and it's a shame i think they could have done more with don't breathe Two. i don't know why they made him the protagonist um maybe because he was a quasi protagonist because those people did break into his house but then he did have this girl but she also did kill his child like you're kind of like like you go back and forth on his character. Like yeah. his character is, you know, and the insemination is absolutely sexual assault. Um, and you feel bad for his grieving. Like, it's just, it's a really like, they really do a good job of what they say, making it a particular character. Is that what that definition is one where you're not quite sure what the character is? Like they're kind yeah, of I think so, yeah. Broke back and forth. I feel like Darren Wilson would know that. Yeah, Darren, no, he would. Tell us if we're right or not, because you're smarter than Scott and I. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was entertaining. It was an entertaining older film. Did you watch anything or? No, but I didn't get a chance to watch anything older. No, oh, well. Well, besides for our show. Boo-boo. And a boo-boo to you, right? So yeah, right. let's break into what we've been listening to. Right. Uh, so mine is quick. I've been on this true crime kick. And because when you start listening to one true crime podcast, it usually pops up other ones. So there's one that was called True North True Crime. And of course, it's a Canadian-based crime podcast. And it's two people from Vancouver. It's a husband and a wife or, you know, two partners, I should say. I don't know if they're married, but it's great. They they cover some lesser known crimes that have committed in Canada, missing person stories or, um, you know, people that have died and trying to bring justice. So through GoFundMes for the families or just trying to make other people aware of someone who's missing. Oh, Their okay. shows are about 55 minutes in length. They only use um, court documents, interviews from the family, like fact checked information. They don't go a lot on like conspiracy theories or anything like that. Only if it's included in court documents, they will. So like, for example, if they're like, well, we don't know what happened here, but the court suspect one of three things, A, B, C, or D, and they're going to be charged for one of these, right? It's very factual, under an hour long. These two are very easy to listen to. I love that they do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of their podcast. Um, Scott and I don't do that. And maybe we should think about doing that. I think it's, I think it's very respectful. And I think that, you know, yeah, I I just think it's really respectful and I really appreciate that they do that. And I love how they focus on Canadian, um, lesser known crimes. I find it extremely fascinating. So you can find it on Spotify, uh, podcast addict, just type in true North, true crime. If this sounds like something for you. Nice. Um, yeah, the show that I'm going to talk about, uh, I just to give a uh, disclaimer, I'm in the middle of The Shining, so I'm just going to hold off on talking about that until I actually finish it, uh, just because I haven't had a whole lot of time to do uh, audiobooks this week. Uh, so I decided for today, I will be talking about the uh, Dead Meat podcast, which is a regular audio podcast, as well as they have their own YouTube channel. And it's uh, the hosts are Chelsea uh, and Chelsea and James. And they usually will cover newer films as they're released and like talk, talk about the film, review it, and sometimes do uh, interviews with cast or directors or things like that. They're, but the YouTube channel is the part that I've watched a lot of. And it's mainly been Jesse on the YouTube channel. And, uh, or sorry, James. And he does these YouTube ones where it's... Uh, kill counts for different horror films oh, go cool. through each individual fill or each individual kill talk about the kill a little bit and then do like a count at the end of how many there were he went through into the friday the 13th franchise he even did jurassic park and stuff like that i he's a very entertaining host as well as uh chelsea they're both very good at what they do and i definitely recommend checking them out uh but yeah that is the dead meat podcast which can be found on podcast addict and all the other like places that podcasts can be found awesome thanks scotty 
Yeah. Uh, so we'll take a brief break here from one of our Legion podcast friends, and then we'll be back with our main part of the episode, which is the rise of the Airbnb. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Cha-cha. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Ah, necrophilia. Ah, ah, ah. It's a dead issue, man. Don't, don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of. It's unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this movie. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. And welcome back. As discussed in the first part of our episode, we're going to talk about the rise of Airbnb and, of course, uh, on rentals and their effect in horror movies. So first, let's talk a little bit about the Airbnb startup story. So we found a little article um, that's just called the Airbnb startup story, The Journey, and it talks a little bit about how Airbnb came to be. So Air, Air Beds and Rentals, the Airbnb startup story. The first Airbnb startup story revolved around airbeds and rentals. Back in October 2007, the 2B Airbnb founder and his roommate, Joe Gabia, were looking for means to pull in extra cash with the upcoming industrial design year conference in San Francisco. There was a shortage of hotel rooms and accommodation. Both were unemployed and with their San Francisco apartment rent due in a few weeks. The pair saw this as an opportunity. The duo rented out their apartment loft to designers looking for a place to stay. Immediately, Chekski and Gabia launched a simple website, airbedandbreakfast.com, and offered airbeds and homemade breakfast for $80 each night. When three people showed up at their doorstep, Chesky and Gabba thought they may have stumbled upon a big idea. Joe Gabba's former roommate, Nathan, I can't even put this correctly it's it's baroski uh bletcher seek i would say i think that's polish we'll call him nathan join the team <laughs> as one of the airbnb founders and develop a business model around this idea however that idea may not fly the airbnb founder shelved airbnb chesky and gaddy then tinkered with the concept of a roommate matching service Four weeks into the project, the founder realized that roommates.com already existed with no other alternative. The team went back to Airbnb or Airbed and breakfast. The Airbnb founder, along with Gabby and Nathan, staged various attempts to launch the venture since 2008. One was the SXSW conference where the website received only two bookings. One was one of the founders. <laughs> Secondly, learning from that experience, the room shortage meant people were looking for alternative accommodation options. The team launched again in the 2008 Democratic National Conference in Denver with this dismal results. While the team was able to get media attention, user traction did not follow. This part of the Airbnb startup story was what Airbnb founder Brian called the tough, the throw of sorrows, neck deep in debt. Airbnb was in dire need of funding. In the context of Airbnb's startup story, generating revenue and finding investors came from an unusual source. Since the bed part of bed and breakfast was not getting favorable results, they thought, why don't we focus on the breakfast side of the equation? Riding on the election fever, they thought of creating presidential-themed breakfast cereals. <laughs> the Obama O's, the breakfast of change in Captain McCain's, a maverick in every bite. Obviously, these guys are Democrats. Uh, the founders handcrafted numbers, numbered and sold each limited edition cereal box for $40 a piece. 
The cereal box idea will go down in the end in the Airbnb startup story as a much needed break that kept the company afloat for a few more months. So apparently this paid off and people bought these cereals. I never knew these cereals existed. Did you, Scott? You're on mute. <laughs> nope. No, I did not. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. And then you're also on mute. You were so taken back by my story. You put yourself on mute. <laughs> uh, the proceeds from the cereal box almost pulled the company out of debt and gained Airbnb some national press coverage. In November 2008, Y Combinator founder Paul Graham was not convinced that the Airbnb business model would work, but through the presidential theme box serials, the venture, the venture capitalist was impressed by the founder's spirit and passion. So I guess where we are today, the company inclusion in the Y Combinator program pushed the Airbnb founder to focus on making the company ramen profitable by demo day. The tide of the recession was hitting the shores and there is a high possibility that no investors would show up at the demo day. In order to prepare for this possibility, the goal of each startup within the batch is to be ramen profitable by the end of the program. Ramen profitable means that the business is profitable if you just live on ramen. <laughs> That's funny. Kind of like uh, college life. Right? With a $20,000 seed funding, a clear goal and a better work structure, the founders of Airbnb traveled to New York where a majority of their community was located. In the Airbnb startup story, this is the part where things head in the right direction. For the next three months, Airbnb focused on a relationship with their customers. The founders supported their hosts by uploading photos and showcasing their properties. They also guided the hosts on how to create the best homestay experience. By the end of the Y Combinator program, the founders were able to create a group of loyal customers who not only love the company, but also help the company grow its customer base. Also, Airbnb was able to secure over $600,000 funding. Um, and from this point on, Airbnb was unstoppable. At face value, letting a stranger into your home sounds like a preposterous idea, but the world of startups have proven time and time and again that what sounds like a crazy idea may actually be the next big thing. Airbnb startup story is proof, breaking the mold that Airbnb's strength through Airbnb's founding years and this quality has propelled the company's mission of creating a world where everyone can belong. So really what's happened is Airbnb has created this environment where you can rent out your home to make profits, having complete control over that, as well as you have people who are traveling who have the opportunity to stay somewhere that's cheaper than a hotel. I had this experience when I went to Michigan uh, before I knew Scott uh, back in 2018. And I rented an Airbnb uh, myself. And um, I think I went with four other people. We stayed in this Airbnb and it was great. It was cheaper than if we had got a hotel. We stayed for, I think it was just one night and it was way, way, way cheaper, way, way cheaper. Very nice. Um, and you know, like when you go to a hotel, to be honest, it's it's like the same shit that you get in Airbnb. Only in Airbnb, sometimes they'll leave you treats or, you know, it's, it's a bigger space. You have more privacy and usually they'll have rules like no partying, no this, no that. And I'm, I'm definitely a component and supporter of Airbnb. I think yeah. it's where it's at now. My new Airbnbs could go wrong and renting someone's property can go wrong. I've also rented people's cottages and other such things like that before, which is where two of our other stories are going to play into it. Um, but yeah, what about you, Scott? Have you ever rented an Airbnb or done a rental of someone else's place? Uh, I have not actually like, I mean, obviously like, I kind of sort of rental with the whole UP trip to the cabin, but like that was also, you know, family, yeah. uh, but no, I've always wanted to do an Airbnb and I've looked into them when I've planned traveling and stuff like that. And man, they are so cheap. Like, and a lot of the places are really nice. And I like my, my parents, when they go on their trips, they always do Airbnbs and the places they get just look so freaking beautiful. Well, it makes sense. Right. And it's cheaper. And I think that or when you're renting someone's vacation home, like what we'll see in the first two movies that we talk about is people actually staying in like family or other relations homes and things don't always go to plan. So your UP trip does tie into this uh, because you are staying at a family's friend, uh, like it's Ron's family's cottage, which is your cousin, yep. right? Yep. So it's enough removed. Um, but yeah, so why don't we get into our movies and talk about where people have vacation in rental homes or Airbnbs and things have gone horribly wrong. All right, so the first movie of our topic is going to be The Strangers, which was released on May 30th of 2008. James Hoyt and Kristen McKay go to a remote house to spend some quality time with each other, but in the wee hours of the morning, a knock at the door changes their lives. Dun, dun, dun. 
Yeah, but uh, this one, uh, this was my second time watch for this film. Like, I only watched it once way before, and I thought it was okay back then. I love it a lot more now, but that's because of the whole relationship aspect of it as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, this has that total in the middle of nowhere beautiful vacation home setting like this house is very just big and gorgeous and like definitely like that nice type of getaway home Mm -hmm. and it definitely feeds on the whole fear of a knock at the door at like three four o'clock in the morning it's absolutely terrifying because if you're getting a knock on the door at that late it's either an emergency or something bad Yes, you are 100% right. It is usually not people selling cookies. <laughs> yeah. um, definitely not. I, I love the setup of this film and how it's filmed. I think it it shows them coming to the home, going into the home. You see that it's all romantically set up, but yet they don't look like they feel like being romantic with each other at all. Yep. Um, there's obviously some tension that's going on between the two of them. And I really love the, you know, you see the boyfriend kind of go into a separate room after he helps his girlfriend take off her dress so she can have a bath or a shower or whatever it is she's doing. And he's talking to his buddy and he's obviously at his family's like vacation home. Yeah. Um, He doesn't go there a lot. That was always the impression I got is that this was like, he's not there frequently enough. Um, And, you know, the night didn't go as planned. We find out later he proposed, she rejected his proposal. And they're trying to just kind of survive this evening, go through their relationship stuff. And just when they're about to basically engage in sex, which is, I guess, kind of a makeup thing that they're doing, they get a knock at the door. And there's these three individuals that torture them throughout the evening. Yeah, the whole creepy uh, girl in the shadows with the light, the porch light being like unscrewed and like Mm -hmm. around the porch and is going, is Tamara home? And just mm-hmm. like, and then just doesn't say anything after that when they're like, uh, I think you got the wrong house. And mm-hmm. then she just kind of walks away. It's like, that right there is already unsettling. And then what makes this even more intense is, you know, they after that incident happens, they just kind of sit there and discuss things a little more. And he's just like, all right, I need to leave the house, which he's already, he was already drunk when they drove in. He drank a full bottle of wine while he was there. And now he's going to go drive away. I know. a fucking terrible idea. Yeah, but, but yeah, uh, nothing happens to him. So, yeah. you know, like that part is just totally skipped over in this entire film. His, yeah. His, you know, you're always, you're, it, I didn't even notice it until you brought it up, Scott. Like, you're right. He was excessively drinking and driving the entire time. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, and obviously that's a setup for the creepiness that occurs. She's alone in this rental or in this home. She's never been there before. Um, and you see there's one great scene where she's at the kitchen getting a glass of water. And in the background, you see one of the figures yes. in the house. Yes, wearing at that creepy ass mask. And I, when I first saw this film, I was like, fucking bravo. This is how a subtly creepy horror film is done. Because there really isn't, like there is gore in this eventually mm-hmm. at the end. Um, but you don't get a lot of gore. It's more of the suspense of these three individuals stalking them. And yes. doing and playing that creepy record. And yet again, an example of really creepy music in a movie. And you set the stage at a place where you are unfamiliar. You're staying there. Like, it's like if you come up to see me next weekend and I go out and you're left alone in my house and shit starts happening. Right. You're going to be like, what the fuck is going on? Because it's an area that is unfamiliar to you. You, you're you're isolated now add here no no one's been around they haven't heard a dog bark there's no one around obviously there's you know they're very very isolated and removed from everyone yeah, you don't even see any neighbor houses around or anything like right that. nothing the only thing that happens is the best friend shows up who they accidentally shoot yeah which oh which that, is tragic yeah that was very tragic and when i seen it this time i was just like hey that's dennis reynolds from it's always sunny that psychopath <laughs> is that who that was yep oh that's awesome i uh i really think this movie does isolation vacation horror well they show up late at this rental um you know they have their issues within their relationship with is kind of like you could have not had that they could have just been a happy couple that showed up honestly right. their relationship doesn't really pack anything except for the fact that they come together at the end but the when she's crawling through the fucking backyard to try oh, to get man. away like 
you believe Liv, Ta- Liv Tyler's performance in this. Like, oh, absolutely. fucking Robo. Like, I don't think she's a great actress by any stance, but I don't know what she did here. She pulled on some fucking acting chops that I didn't know she had. And she pulled off some really great scenes. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say, going back to what you were saying about, like, you know, they could have uh, left out that whole relationship part with what was mm-hmm. going on. I, um, but bravo for them because what that piece of that relationship did for the beginning of this film is already put you in a tense, awkward yeah, situation. Good point. And then it gets even more tense as shit happens, which yeah. I think it just kind of just adds to the film, like the building of that suspension and tension. And like, but yeah, like her screaming and crawling through all, well, like, yeah, she wasn't really screaming then because she was trying to hide and crawling through that. But like, yeah, just her trying to like, get a cell signal and all this like because once again you're in the middle of nowhere more than likely you're not gonna have cell service because like i didn't have cell service up in the up in the middle of nowhere yeah and it all depends on well your and this is obviously. also back in 2008 yeah like we're Which looking 13 worse. years ago where cell service really blew yeah. now you can get cell service Most. almost anywhere right like yeah. it's it's you know you gotta be in like i go hiking a lot now scott and i were talking about this off air um, I do a lot of hikes. I've really gone into hiking in provincial parks. And there's one park I go to here that's pretty high up and I can still have clear cell service, you know? So like, I think it, but back in 13 years ago, cell service was a little bit harder to come by. So I yeah. think this does capture the time very, very well. Oh, it definitely does. And, but yeah, like this is just a very, very well done one for our topic. Cause like it does the whole vacation home isolation and it does the whole building of tension, not knowing anybody around you, and then having these just literally these strangers in masks just who are just doing this because they're there. Yeah, um, I, I think the ending scene, too, where they tie them up and she has to watch him be tortured. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, how they're found by the young children who I think are supposed to be Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, if they were either Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, I wasn't Mormons, sure. Mormons, right? um that are doing the door to door and she wakes up screaming like talk about fucking terrifying yeah um i thought this movie when it came out was brilliant i think it's brilliant still today i think it it masters the whole rental idea very well before rentals like airbnb as we saw it was just starting in 2008 it would have been really interesting if they used an airbnb right Um, but they used a home that was a you know kind of related to the family kind of that they were staying at and i thought that was really clever really really clever i think this is a really well done well made horror film one of my favorite horror films of all time if i was to make a you know top 50 list it would definitely be on there yeah i think it would be on my list as well because yeah this is the second time really sold it for me that's awesome the first time I wasn't nearly as, I think I wasn't really giving it the attention it deserved. Well, it was 13 years ago too. And your perspective, right. you would have been what, 26? Yeah. Right. So like, you know, you're also now, you know, turning 40 soon. Your perspective has <laughs> changed, right? Like it, it's changed. Our perspectives at 38 and 40 are different than what they would have been in their mid twenties. Oh, absolutely. Like life experiences, you know, relationship experiences, um disappointment like that film you're right it does really explore disappointment and almost feeling of betrayal yeah when she turns down his proposal you know like that's a really awkward thing to have happen and i think it actually takes a a lot of guts for people to turn down a proposal because it can be so uncomfortable oh absolutely Um, but yeah i i I, you know we're not talking about relationship here or here but i think that that's a really important part of the film and you're right it does help playing to the creepiness and it was weird that it, it 10 years before a sequel came, but 10 years later, we got ourselves a sequel. So let's run into that one. All right. So yeah, The uh, Strangers Pray at Night, which was released March 9th, 2018. Mike and his wife, Cindy, take their son and daughter on a road trip that becomes their worst nightmare. The family members soon find themselves in a desperate fight for survival when, when they arrive at a secluded mobile home park that mysteriously deserted until three masked psychopaths show up to satisfy their thirst for blood. Um, this one, uh, it definitely goes the more like 80s slasher style, I will say mm-hmm. right off the bat, instead of like the tension home invasion. Mm-hmm. But uh, since we're talking about the vacation home things, what this place reminded me of is those uh, like really nice trailer parks that are like nearby a lake that you go to yes. for holidays, yes. shit like that. Yes. And that's kind of why we wanted to bring this up as one of our movies. Um, though this one, I feel, doesn't... Uh, it uses the 
isolation of the community, even though like it is kind of weird that no one else is around. I guess, well, they do say it's off season. Oh, right? that's right. They do. Okay. And they pull in, they're like, where is everybody? And they're like, well, it's off season. Everyone pieces out after Labor Day. And like, honestly, I went to a lake, my, my park I go to, I showed you a picture. I went swimming in that lake. I was literally the only one there. Oh, wow. Only one. Like it was a perfect slasher scene uh for jason to pop out of the woods and get me like it was fucking preem for the picking so i do believe that after labor day it would be cleared out and we all know the family who owns the trailer park who they're going to go stay there has been killed but they get there so late that they assume that they're in bed you know like that's a very fair assumption to make yep so yeah that makes more sense why it just seemed so like empty there that i forgot about i missed that part when yeah I was it's a throwaway that. line they say that everyone clears out after labor day yep so that makes sense then and yeah that definitely fits my whole theory of it being like the vacation mobile homes for yeah. around like a lake yeah um but yeah this one uh doesn't really focus on the homes like being in the home nearly as much it's more uh played as a cat and mouse hiding mm-hmm. like throughout the whole park yep and uh like the one thing that, you know, talking about the cell service thing in the first movie, this one, they had cell service, but these uh, stalkers slash killers are smart and uh, destroy all the phones when no one is in the trailer. Yeah. And like yeah. literally destroy, like, I think one was starting to work, but well, then shit happens to her. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah this one definitely, I wouldn't say is nearly as tense and like good at building the suspension. This one is more just like really like starts off fast paced and the killers are right there. There's no like them like sitting in the background, like popping up and you going, oh shit. They're just kind of there in your face, ready to kill you in this one. Absolutely. And I think the filming of both of these are different, but unique. Yeah. The, 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 the scene I'm thinking of is when he goes to the pool and he's fighting that dude. Oh, yeah. And it's going in and out of the water and you hear the music and then you don't hear the music and then you hear the music and you don't hear the music. And I thought that was really fucking clever. Um, The filming of this film is excellent. Like the the two films, I don't know if it was the same director or not. Um, We didn't look that up because Scott and I aren't that good at podcasting. Yeah, I I know Brian Pertino did the first one. I'm looking up the second one right now. Because I really enjoyed how these two films were created. And I'll continue to chat while you do that. I also really liked the relationship between the family I did enjoy how the mother sacrifices herself so her daughter can survive. I believed that scene. I believed the interactions between the father and the son. Like I believed all the interactions. And then I believed that the son and the daughter, like the brother and the sister, were going to try to fucking survive this night. And and how they like kind of came together and really had each other's back and did what they had to do to make it out of this situation. And I think that chick was an excellent final girl. Like, oh, she absolutely was. She did everything smart. Like she was smart about everything for the most part. Right. And like, even then, you know, she's young. Right. So, but the part where she crawls into that metal tunnel and then the character, one of the killers is in the tunnel with her and then just peeks. Oh, that scene. Oh my God. The first time I saw that scene, it terrified me. Um, I remember when they made the strangers pray at night and I thought this is going to be really hard to follow up to the first film. It's going to be extremely challenging because the first film was so unique so different at the time. And I I did appreciate the change they made with this. I, I enjoyed the fact that they were at a trailer park off season and they included so many factors in it. They included how big the park is and how confusing it is and all trailers look the same after a while and how lost and disoriented you can get. I like how they did the pool scene. I think that pool scene is one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, right same. from when he kills the chick, she's sneaking up behind him and like the camera's filming from far away. And she runs behind him and he turns around just in time and knocks her out and then stabs her. Yeah, like that like, whole scene is filmed just beautifully. And he says to the guy who's coming, he's dragging the fucking like, um, what is it, sledgehammer? He's like, yep. I killed one of yours. Um, how does that feel? Like, I like honestly, like that scene alone, I'm like, if we gave out awards for horror scenes, like if we were doing this in 2018, that would have got an award for me. I oh, think yeah. that fucking scene is just out of this world well done and it just captures the isolation and he's trying to basically fight off these two people um on his own. Yeah, and he's and he's a young kid too, which like it, right? he he's fighting a grown ass man and a grown ass woman. And they were and I think you really do get behind these two characters. I will say more than you get behind the characters in the first one. Like in the first one, you feel bad for them, but you're also like, man, she said no to him. Like there's a little bit more of emotions here 
here you see these two kids just lost their fucking parents. Yeah. Who just basically sacrificed themselves for their kids. And they literally both watched their parents die. Like, right. The sister watched the mother die. The son watched the father die. Right. And like, and now they're brother and sister. And like, you even see at the end when she's sleeping beside him in the hospital room, how close they are. Yeah. And when like that car comes through and she, and he's treating her wounds and they're having that story about like when he was a kid and he hurt himself and he came home and pretended like nothing was wrong. And then they fucking drive that car into the trailer Mm. and you see their faces on the couch. Like the filming of this movie is fucking like praise to it. Even if people don't like this as much as the original, because they don't like the plot or whatever, that's fine. But the filming of this movie is incredible. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, I did find the director and it is a different director. It is Johannes Roberts, but it was written by Brian Pertino who did, did direct and write the first film. Okay, so there was, you know, a kind of continuation then. That's cool. Yeah, and, uh, but speaking of the uh, well-done shots, I know this really doesn't talk about, like, er, come in on the vacation home part, but I yeah. just have to bring this shot up just because it's so beautiful, is uh, it is an homage as well. The part where the final killer that's left, the grown-ass adult guy, is driving the truck while it's on fire over the bridge, chasing the girl down. Yes, yes. It's an homage to Christine, and... Yeah. It just the way it is shot, it's just like it's just so beautifully done. There was a lot of homages in this where she jumps into the pickup truck and tells him to drive. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was uh, Texas, yeah, Texas Chainsaw. Right? So, like, it was it was a really well done, you know, it does a great job of the seclusion piece. The pool piece tends to probably to me stands out the most vacation. You got the cheesy palm trees and shit like <laughs> yep. that. And I think the the isolation of getting disoriented in a trailer park is really, really well done here at night. You have no idea where you're going. You know, this all takes place in the wee hours of the night to the morning of yeah. these guys trying to survive this. I think the relationships and the acting is very good. Um, yet again, a very small cast in this film. And um, they pull it out very, very well. Yeah, and I have to say, when it comes to the relationship part with the brother and sister, because it starts off with them, you know, being mad at each other. like Yeah, the, typical the sisters, siblings, right? Yeah, like the sister feels like the brother is against her and all this, like, because she's getting pretty much put in a boarding school. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, I like how the building of that relationship where they just get kind of kind of closer as the film progresses. Yeah, and you can see as they're telling stories and stuff, they always were close, you know, that they did right. have a relationship. Um, but yeah, the acting was really, really well done. I, I thought they were all really, really good. Good film, good film. It's not the sequel I thought it was going to be, but I enjoyed it for what it is. Yeah, and I think this is a, uh, because I don't think they could have done a sequel like similar to The Strangers and it been just as successful. The way they did it and turned it into like a slasher film, like I think was the right choice. And I'm glad they didn't bring in Liv Tyler. Like yeah. it would have been too cheesy for her to be showing up 10 years later. Like, hey guys, like I survived too, you know? Right. Like, Let me tell you the story about these killers that I don't know anything about. <laughs> you know, I guess what's better is that he... Ideally, you think that they got all of them, but we don't actually know if she right. got all of them, right? Yeah, but yeah, that is a very good film. I guess we can jump on into our uh, next film. So two disclosures for these two ones that we are doing now. We are doing A Perfect Host, which was released last year, and A Super Host, which was released this year. So there will be spoilers to these two films. If for some reason you have not seen them and uh, you don't want to have them spoiled, here is your fair warning. But these are two recent films, that was in 2020 and 2021, that we will be talking about in fairly, um, you know, fair enough detail that it may spoil something for you. So, yeah. All right. So, yeah, let's get into these. Uh, Perfect Coast, which was released February 4th, 2020. A weekend getaway soon turns into a living nightmare when an obsessive bodybuilder torments four friends at an isolated lake house. Uh, This one is definitely the uh, fits the title of this film because they do go to an Airbnb. And this bodybuilder they are talking about in this uh, synopsis is the host of this house. And he is, it's like this couple, like you almost think they're a couple, but you find out they're just like really good friends where one wants more than the other does because of something that happened. But they end up getting there and the code doesn't work. So they, the guy messages and call or calls the host to try to get the new code or whatever. And the dude responds like, doesn't answer his phone but responds by text immediately Mm -hmm. and uh like gives him the same code and it works but i like this because this kind of uh ties into the strangers a bit because after he gets that code and they walk in the house 
you see standing in the background the host holding a phone just like off in the distance watching them mm-hmm. and, like mm-hmm. he's just kind of subtly there I, I never noticed that the first time we watched this this time around i did but yeah he it's once again this one of these movies where the host is just very weird and like intrusive to these people because obviously when you go to an airbnb you don't actually expect to maybe meet the host you expect to go there have your stay clean up and do what you need to do and then leave and not have to really deal with the host of the airbnb as far as i know yes i would agree that's what i prefer i don't yeah. want to meet with the person that i'm staying there with it's weird or yeah, stay at their place i could understand like maybe meeting them like right when you're getting to the house yeah like they let me in or something like that for sure yeah. but i don't want to be like hanging out with them right you're wanting to get there to to enjoy your vacation not with some yeah. stranger and yes. this guy is very intrusive tad. on that tad uh he is like literally the health nut guru like talks about uh, all these like coffee is poison and oh my poison god I, I i love the scene where so scott's painting it perfectly this, these two friends show up and they're hanging out in this airbnb and i do really love how like there's nothing in the airbnb to watch except for some weird fucking like a yeah, body of the gods too body of the gods fucking film and you know the the rooms are very much set up, set up like an like a airbnb like with the blankets and everything like that and the next day they get up and <laughs> he feels sorry for tad who's hanging around so he's working out with them and the main chick offers tad coffee and he's like did you just offer me poison like i fucking <laughs> die like i just think it's really really funny um because tad is just so over the top Oh, like, he is. And I think he's acting that like that purposely because everyone else acts fairly normal in the film. Like yeah. they act like the brunette is probably the best actress, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, I think so. He and she's been in a lot of other stuff. Like she definitely has acting chops. Um, but you feel like you're just watching a group of friends hang out. And then you got this guy who's just the, fucking over the top with like the fitness stuff, over the top with like sharing his opinions over the top like hyper it's just everything's extreme yeah and like he's uh what was it uh, i forget the main guy's name but when he's coming downstairs after their first night tad's in the house like making, oh, a, making a smoothie protein shake yeah or something like that yeah it's like <laughs> like in their house like completely intrusive uh right? he really shows up multiple times like just to like make them dinner because he feels bad because he's seen them on the lake and chased them down with a canoe and accidentally flipped them in their canoe and well, i think he phone. purposely fixed them yeah well i mean them, at yeah. that scene though yeah. accidentally yeah yeah but yeah he is just so over the top and like you said it is that's exactly what he's trying to do he's trying to make them uncomfortable oh my gosh like so over the top uncomfortable and this is different than superhost because in this one um he does own the property he does live there and you know that he's probably basically what you find out later is that his wife has this disorder and she needs what he thinks is fresh blood all the time to keep her healthy yeah. And so he takes these Airbnb people, like obviously not all of them, but some of them, kills them and gives them or keeps them alive and then does blood transfusions. Yes. With this with his wife. And you know, of course you have to have some forgiveness here because obviously he doesn't get everybody because people have to go and like give positive reviews so other people keep going to the site or to their to the Airbnb location, right? But it does give a capture that you don't really know where you're staying and who the host is you know and really i think 95 percent of people in this world are good yeah and you have nothing to worry about but it does plant as we talked about in our earlier episodes that seed of doubt of yep, and, what if right yeah and especially because you know like i said i have not been to an airbnb but i was going to ask you about this is there like some airbnb airbnbs where there is a room that's locked that you can't go into yeah usually they do have like a locked room and they bring this up in super host as well yeah i've only been to one and yeah there was out of bounds spaces and you just figure that's because wherever you are they keep storage for things and they don't want you going through and stealing shit so i totally get that yeah um and but i this right. plays into that creepiness factor of it though because you never know what could be behind that door right i and this is obviously yet again a low budget film they they definitely didn't have a lot of money going into this but i think they use the concept of airbnb and travel really well and not knowing who you're staying with and this guy just being an over-the-top obsessed bodybuilder uncorked picked up the rights to this film for distribution and i think that this is very much an uncorked film because it's a hidden gem yeah. I think a lot of people watched the rental last year and was like, oh, the rental. And even though the perfect host is not as, you know, it doesn't have the money put into that the rental had. I honestly think a perfect host is a much better story. Yeah, better story. I, and I think even better acting even. 
Yeah. And I think it's more believable. I think it's more believable that there could be this crazy dude who kills some people that stairs that stays at the Airbnb. Now how he's been able to get away with it for so long and people not come looking for them. Yeah. You could say the same thing about the rental where this guy breaks into a whole bunch of fucking rental places and kills people. Right. So like, you know, either way you can kind of argue logic on that, but I think this one with the host being there and being so intrusive and his purpose behind it and like making fun of the health industry and the fitness industry like it's making fun of like so many things and like the whole we're just friends but the guy wants to be more than friends but the girl's completely oblivious to it or pretends like she doesn't know what's going on like it's overall such a great film it's a really enjoyable 2020 film that came out last year yeah and i think it got i think i gave it a shout out last year for something i feel like it won an award for me yeah i think i I remember it did i just can't remember what category which award it was but i i really think it's a great film and seeing it again yet again you do have to enjoy low budget but i think it captures the airbnb and rental feeling really well the concept of a creepy house yeah i completely 100 percent agree this like this has that airbnb feel like and what they would do like all right yep no tv so we're just gonna drink and have a chat and then go to bed wake up enjoy the weather outside by the lake like it just truly feels like they are on vacation in someone else's house absolutely right like and it does feel that isolation because you're on one of those like houses or even when he makes some dinner and it's super awkward because like and that's and that happens in this film and in super host yeah um and it's funny because it goes back to the original concept at airbnb which is where they did make you food um which is interesting that that was the original launch of the concept right right so but let's move to our next one because it's very similar to this one oh it's very similar all right yet again this is a 2021 film everybody it was just dropped recently so there will be spoilers yep spoiler spoiler all right so superhost which was released august 16th 2021 two travel vloggers check into a vacation rental with a host that will do anything for a good review That is pretty simple synopsis, but pretty accurate. Um, Before I dive too far into this, I just want to say, I feel this movie watched a perfect host and said, let's steal a lot of these ideas. Oh, 100%. The whole, uh, the, the vloggers get to the house, the code doesn't work. They text the girl and she texts back the exact same code they already had. They get right into the house. Um, we'll get into more, but like, yeah, like the whole cooking breakfast and all this stuff and yeah. being, and being intrusive. But yeah. yeah, these are the video vloggers like we kind of brought up in the our 2021 watches. They go to these Airbnbs and pretty much do a YouTube style review for them. Mm-hmm. And obviously this can be good or bad for the person that owns the Airbnb. And this woman is that the host, the super host, because that's the name of the show, (laughs) name of the YouTube show they're talking about here. uh, She is extremely quirky. And I have to say, steals the fucking movie for me. I love her to death because she's just so bad. Great actress. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, she comes over like right when they walk in the house and she's just talking. Oh, I hope I get a good review. I hope this doesn't uh, take away from my review and blah, blah, blah. Like, just like, you know, completely worried that this review is going to destroy her is how she's portraying it. And I like this because this focuses also on like if there is an issue with the Airbnb. So say like the toilet being clogged that happens in this movie. They get a hold of the host to like either have someone come out to take care of it or she will come out personally and take care of it. Like that's something I've heard of that does happen. It does. So here's my flaws with this film where I think the perfect host did it better. Yeah. Um, Tad in the perfect host was way more responsive, like what an Airbnb person would be if they lived on site. The fact that she comes over and sees the toilet is clogged and it's like, I'll come back in the morning to fix it. Like you're not going to use the bathroom between like whatever it is, 5 p.m. and 10 a.m. the next day. Right. So you're going to let a bunch of urine and feces build up in the toilet before, like, you know what I mean? Like that to me is completely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and she brings a plunger just so we're clear. That's what her tool is to use. I think that's poor writing personally. Um, oh, yeah. My other beef with this film, and and yet again, I thought this film was fun. I thought the girl was perfect. She was over the top. The term super host is something that Airbnb hosts can actually get. You can become a super host because you give, get such great reviews. You oh, okay. get so many like five-star reviews or whatever, you become a super host. As we find out later, and this is where the big spoiler is, everyone, she is not the owner. She stayed in the Airbnb. She's obviously a loner. 
it was an older couple that owned it with a dog with a dog or a cat, a cat or something yeah cat, cat. there's a cat room right and she kills them and then she's about to leave the airbnb when these people show up so i don't know why she was so obsessed with getting a good review when she didn't even own the rental home in the first place. I think that was her just wanting to fuck with them and her just wanting okay. to pretend to be the host. Because as you see throughout this movie, she is so batshit insane that yeah, I think... she's a psychopath, yeah. Yeah, so I think she's basically just doing it to fuck with them. Kind of like what Tad does with constantly in her, in being intrusive and wanting to fuck with them. And having fun before he really, you know, gets to what he's doing. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what she was doing. Though, mm -hmm. once again, Perfect Host did it better. Did a lot yeah. of things better than this. And well, this the plot still... made more sense in the Perfect Host because Tad's wife needs the blood. Yeah. Like, he's fucking with people because he's also seeing who he can take advantage of, right? And he's also lonely and he's messed up and it and it's his place. Yeah. You know, he, he quotes the rental agreement thing, which she does too. She does stuff like that as well like and i just find it and how mad she gets at barbara crampton for showing up and barbara crampton so barbara crampton was the host of another airbnb this couple stayed there gave a horrible review barbara crampton stalks them throws like breaks their window of the airbnb which makes zero sense why would you come up and break the window why not break the window of their car Right. No, they like, she she damages someone else's property. Right. And then the Becca, the host, who isn't really the host, is like, no, why would you do that to my property? I, I hear you, Scott. Like she was trying to fuck with them, but I just honestly feel like you're right. I think they watched a perfect host and they were like, Oh, we'll just make this movie super size and we'll make it so she's a psychopath. But then when you look back on parts of the film, you're like, but that doesn't make like there were, you know, tell tips, like she brought only a plunger over to help fix the toilet. Right. There's like a 12 hours room. later, right? There's a cat room in the Airbnb, which I already going, why is there a cat room? <laughs> right. Like there's just so many things. Which there, you know, there was a cat room and there was a cat room in the Airbnb because she did rent out that Airbnb, but the couple told her she had to leave. Yeah. Right? Well, I'm just saying, I, I just kind of thought it was out there because the couple has a cat. So I just thought it was weird that there was a cat room in this Airbnb. Or was this the couple's house? That was I, also an Airbnb. Maybe that doesn't give great detail. All yeah. we know is that she stayed there and they were nice to her, but then they told her she had to leave and she got angry and killed them. Yeah. See, like as we pick apart this Airbnb horror stuff, it doesn't make as much no. sense as a perfect host did. Like a perfect host, yes, yet again, I understand that it's about some crazy fitness dude, and I'm not trying to say that that makes tons of sense, but the setup of the Airbnb makes more sense. The yeah. guy says, I live on a trailer off the property, I'm a minimalist, I rent out my house. All right. Yeah. That's why he was able to get there so quickly if they had issues. Like, with her, she's like, I inherited this house, like, I believe that story that she gives, says that she stays off on the property, but then so many other things happen throughout it where I'm like, she doesn't, like, she's so obsessed with being a super host. And I don't know. I, I, I enjoy, I think if you take out the logic of the whole rental stuff and the Airbnb shit, and you just look at this as a fun psycho person taunting these two people, it's great. Because yeah. the two couple, the couple isn't likable. The guy is more likable than the girl, but the girl is not likable at all. Right. right? Yeah. And like, and like I said, it's uh, Becca that steals the entire show for me because just because of how well she portrays this character. Absolutely. Like, it may not make sense, but, like, she is fun to watch. Her and, acting is amazing. She yeah. is, she makes this film. If they had hired a shittier actress, this film would have been a big piece of garbage. Yeah, because she, she right. makes, like, she makes scenes feel very uncomfortable with just, like, when they do the uh, interviewing of the host, and they're doing, like, yeah. recording it, and she just sits there in silence with this really crazy smile on her face for a second, and she's like, oh, that's creepy. Like, right. just, and like, her facial answers, expressions. Yeah. Yeah. And the directing was good. Obviously, the directing of this, and that's where I feel like a perfect host they directed Tad to be a little too over the top. Um, the directing there was a little bit too young, where the directing in Superhost was better. Yeah. But I just feel like the rental piece, and yet again, you know, in this, in this, in our topics, we pick apart our themes. I just feel like the whole Airbnb thing on paper looked good. But when you actually break down to the logic of it, you're like, this makes no sense. Like, and for me, it was the toilet not being fixed for 12 hours or whatever it was. To me, made no sense. Like that would never happen. Never in a billion years would you be like, yeah, no problem. We'll just use this broken toilet that won't flush for 12 hours. And then you bring it, show up with a fucking plunger. Like, come on, movie. Right. Like, <laughs> um, 
And I do enjoy Barb and Garber Cameras, Ca- Crampton's cameo in it. But yet again, I didn't understand the point of that either. Why would she drive there, destroy the Airbnb property, and then they become united? Yeah, her and Becca unite together because like she tells Becca everything about like how they ruined her career with the Airbnb and people stop showing up. So for some reason, her and Becca all of a sudden get an alliance, or at and, least that's what Barbara Crampton would, thinks. And why would this psychopath do this? Because he she wasn't going to kill her. She was going to let them all leave. Yeah. Like I, she like that's what I don't get. She was like, okay, they they play this trank where it looks like she kills Barbara Crampton. She doesn't. Um, and Barbara Crampton's like, haha, that's what you guys get. Fuck you, haha. And they're leaving. And then the guy says something like, Where's that couple? Yeah. Right. And she's like, you couldn't just let it go. She has this quick dialogue back and forth with Barbara Crampton, kills Barbara Crampton, and then proceeds to kill and torture the couple. Yeah. Like it's like, like <laughs> I don't get it. Like she was purposely having fun fucking with them the entire time. Like, you know, she was gonna kill them. And then she does this joke and then she was gonna let them leave. Yeah. And then she doesn't because yeah, and then she doesn't because they brought up like the past. Right. She did. And I yet again. This is not an insult to the acting of this movie. I think that um, Becca, Rebecca carries it. I think she's a fucking phenomenal. Grace uh, Phillips is the actress. She's been in Tales of Halloween, Fright Night, Some Kind of Hate, Dark Summer. Um, Definitely somebody who's getting around in acting. Awesome. Thought she was wonderful. But if I'm real, like, honest with this film, it doesn't make a fuckload of sense. (laughs) Right. No, it does not. Like, I liked it. I had a good time with it. Don't get me wrong. It was fun. But if we pick it apart in terms of the Airbnb concept of it, there's so many red flags that why would they have stuck around? Right. I would have left, like, after a day or two. I'd been like, yep, this is too much. Let's get out of here. You know what I mean? But I think it's that, I'm thinking maybe they stayed because it's that egotistical vlogger thing where they, like, oh, this place is all sorts of fucked up. We're going to get a lot of views for this. You must be right, because honestly, it makes no other sense for me otherwise. And like, of course, like we see how superficial the chick is because her boyfriend proposes and she thinks it's part of the ploy. Yeah. And get numbers. But I will give it credit for the gore. Like if I look at this, as I said, just as a basic slasher gore fest, excellent scenes. The ending, third act, beautiful in suspense beautiful and not sure if they're going to get away what's going to happen to them really really well done my criticisms are with the writing of the airbnb concept because it just doesn't make a lot of sense and when you name your movie Superhost and it's based off the airbnb concept you should have a little bit more consistencies that's all i'm criticizing yep and since you've experienced airbnbs like i i definitely was kind of curious on this for your thoughts but good movie like both of us enjoyed it like it's a fun film yeah i'll say it's fun but not like fantastic and yeah there is a lot of plot holes but yeah that is that is like how the, like how this film plays out just kind of like it's mainly the script that's the issue right so i'm sure we will see more of these movies to come airbnb horror is not going anywhere the concept of rentals are not going anywhere and i think as we start to travel again uh we'll see them more and more so that was a fun little topic so hopefully it's got y'all ready for when i leave you alone in my house and yeah. you get stalked and my crazy neighbor who also happens to own my home because I'm not really the owner kills me and comes in like you know tries to kill you like a super host well as long as she leaves McMack alone and then Tad will show up and tell you to work out more yeah I'll say I need that I need that motivation <laughs> from Tad <laughs> Tad anyway I guess we should move to our out of the dark and we have some questions yes uh, so I decided uh, we decided to do something fun I, Scott uh, decided this was Scott's brilliant idea not mine. okay well okay fine i'll take the credit for it then well it but, was um, your idea it was not mine so get take the credit right. for these two. well i i uh i've always seen these uh ama things on twitter where it's like ask me anything and it could be like a director or someone a game developer or someone popular and you know people just ask them questions so i was like you know what that'd be kind of fun because i really couldn't think of a good out of the dark segment for this so I was like, well, let's just have uh, our listeners ask us some questions. So I put it out there on Facebook and we got a decent amount of questions. Uh, so I hope you are ready, Heather. Oh, man, I was fucking born ready. All right. So the first question comes from our buddy Ken Bates. What is the first movie, TV show, story, etc. that scared you as a kid? Uh, I'll let you think on it. I already have mine because I've read these already. So uh, for me, the first movie that scared me as a kid, I actually just found this out recently from my mother. 
it was Return of the Living Dead when the tar man comes out of the barrel and is more brains. I was six years old when I seen that. Scared the living shit out of us, me and my brother. And we literally thought that something was going to come and eat our brains. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, for me, it was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And it was the scene where at the, where he's having the confrontation. I can't remember the name of the villain in that. Yeah, something Doom, I forget. Doom, Dr. Part. Doom or something like that. It's something along those lines. Something Doom. And I think it's played by Christopher Lloyd, isn't yep. he? And he's like, I killed your brother. <laughs> and like, he turns into a tune. Um, yes. And that scared the fuck out of me. Which, by the way, Who Framed Roger Robert is not a child's movie. Um, no. My parents let me watch that, probably unaware of all the sexual shit that was in it. And because uh, it had cartoons, they probably thought it was appropriate. Right. Uh, luckily, they didn't make me watch Cool World, which was very much inappropriate yeah. as well, too. Uh, they probably learned with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But yeah, that scene alone, I think really is the first memory I have of being scared by a character in a movie. Because I didn't nice. watch a lot of horror movies until I was older until yep. i was like 13 14 15 i think even yeah 14 15 like it was a very long time before i watched horror movies like i watched abba and costello and stuff like that but nothing that was scary scary right yeah and i was like i, I was kind of curious to see what your answer would be on that one like i'm like solo yeah <laughs> watched it when i was five um yeah no good question thank you so much for that question all right, so we have two questions from our buddy Darren Wilson. No, uh, yeah. we heart Darren. Uh, but he, uh, his first question is a uh, movie that you would want to see again for the first time. Um, for me, I was thinking about this, and I think it would for me have to be Hereditary. Oh, because now you know what happened, so it kind of like ruins it. Yeah, like I still love the movie, but like seeing it for that first time, my jaw was on the fucking floor when I was in theaters. Like just when the daughter gets killed by the fucking getting clotheslined by a fucking telephone pole, and then just seeing uh, Tony Collette's reaction to that of the grief and everything, I'm just I was sitting there stunned, mm, and then cool. like. And then trying to figure out like, okay, is she delusional or is this all about, uh, or is this actually something that's really going on and this kind of supernatural? And like, yeah, once I figured that out and, you know, it's still a great film to like pick apart and find little details in, but that first time experience, man, like I said that I left that theater and I sat in my car for like 15 minutes afterwards, just like completely shook. Like I just had to sit there and just kind of take it all in after watching it. Yeah, it really, that movie really did affect you. I know you've spoken several times about it. It also really reflected Jay uh, from Kill the Cast as well. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, there's two. Uh, one is Jurassic Park. Uh, honestly, I fucking love that movie. And I remember being in grade five. My mom took me for my grade five graduation. We went to KFC for dinner if that's what I wanted to do and then she took me to see Jurassic Park and my mom is a scared person I don't know how she fucking sat through that dinosaur movie and I love that film if it's on tv I'll watch it I think it's, it's great I love I love all the Jurassic Park films I really do they're so simplistic and they're just you know dumb dinosaur movies but I love them I I can't get enough and I think if I'm linking of horror um the village because oh, yeah. I thought the ending of The Village when it came out, I know this is a very controversial pick for a lot of people, but I just remember being like, you know, when that twist happens, I was like, what? Like, I didn't see it coming. Um, maybe now if I watched it, I would. But at the time I was considerably younger and I didn't. And I just wanted to talk about the political meanings behind that. I just wanted oh, yeah. to talk about the logic behind that and how they talked about how they paid planes to not fly over that area. Like that grid was completely removed from civilization till this blind chick wandered out and realized where you were and i honestly think it's some of m night Shyamalan's best work if not his best work personally for me um and that shocking ending that i got and it also kind of showed me how much i i really value social messages in films and how that's a real value to me personally and that yeah that makes total sense for you i can see that right um, his second question that he asked us, uh, favorite local, if possible, urban legend, um, for local urban legend, for me, 
I will, I think I brought this up on like when we did our Urban Legends episode, but uh, the thing that I found out that lives out in Montrose, like that was a legend called the Wakalar, which I literally cannot find much information on it, but a lot of the locals have talked about it. And it's just this beast that you hear out in the middle of like, usually at night, which, you know, probably is just a coyote or something, but it had this extremely unnerving sound to it when we were in the woods at night partying. And it would almost sound like a horse whinnying and then a howl mixed wow. in. It was it was enough to the point where whenever we were out there at night partying and we heard that, we freaked out, ran back to the house. Like yeah, we don't fair enough. And and then like years later I found like we just nicknamed it the beast at the time. But then years later, we find out people in our town called it the Wakalar. And yep, never no one knows any history about it, but that was just like what people were calling it. They some people said it was like a like a myth that was brought down like since the town was created back like in I think 1920 or whatever Montrose was made like into a town so when it was colonized yeah <laughs> pretty much yeah, yeah. uh yeah. but yeah that like they they say that it's been around since that long I mean whether it's true wow. or not who knows but yeah that's the one thing that always sticks in my mind when I think urban legends around my area that's cool uh for me it's uh Bloody Mary Candyman I never say any of that fucking shit in the mirror <laughs> ever and i never will just so we're clear i i don't want to take the chance that it's true and i don't care how that makes me sound on this podcast either i will never ever repeat those names in the mirror creeps me out i believe in ghosts i believe in spirits i believe there's evil and good in this world and i don't want to fuck with any of that shit so that's for me a very simple one anything that involves repeating anything in the mirror to get something to come so I can see it. Nope. Like I wouldn't pay the fucking elevator game. I wouldn't play any of that shit. None of it. Uh, why chance it? <laughs> why chance? You know, why chance it? Why chance it? There's so much drinking and weed smoking to be had in my lifetime. I don't want to take away <laughs> any of those options. So, I yeah, mean, granted, me. granted, like I did chance it with Candyman when I was, uh, when I did acid way back in the day and said Candyman five times in the mirror in the dark. But that was that was a dumb idea. I bet it was. But you lived it to tell freaked it. me out. I did. It freaked me the hell out. But I did it. <laughs> you lived um, for now. And I just want to say, uh, yep, so these were both from Darren Wilson from the Psycho Semantic Podcast. So you know, go give his show a listen because it's fucking awesome, and we love Darren. And he's and also he's from the way BD Clinic. Smarter than us. Way yes, smarter. Way smarter. And we love him. Um, speaking of people, we love Jay Murphy from Kill the Cast. Aw, Jay. Explain in great detail how much you both think I'm attractive. Oh, man. I don't know if we could do that in one podcast. Like, we need a full episode just dedicated to talking about how Jay is, like, the nicest, most politically sound, fair, um, very socially, has a very, very strong social IQ, kind, um, smart person that I know who has an extensive knowledge of, of horror movies. And I think that overall, you know, captured with he's tall, um, he has a very handsome face and just such a infectious laugh just makes him a stud muffin. I, I completely agree. And I also have to say like that sexy ass beard. I love that fucking like, beard. Like, honestly, you know, I feel like you're just trying to grow yours to fit to be like him. I, I am. Like, Jay's, Jay's beard is just beautiful. I love it. Right? And, he is, and yeah, he is just such a kind-hearted soul. I could just oh, pretty much cares and supports for everyone. And he's and knowledgeable. Just, Very knowledgeable. knowledgeable, yes. Yeah. And I'm also, you know, he's he's a bit on the nerdy side. And I think nerds are sexy. Well, you would know you did go pro magic. I almost. did. Oh, well, almost, almost pro. There's going to be a lifetime but... film about Scott almost going pro magic one day. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be pathetic. <laughs> it's going to be the best movie ever. It's going to be better than Killer Prom. Oh, it better be. Oh, God, it better be. <laughs> oh, but uh, moving on to our next one, uh, our good old friend, Phil Ray. Ah, uh, Phil. Uh, and his, uh, he does a show, a uh, YouTube show called What We Listen To. Uh, but he has two questions as well. First one, if I happen to show up your, your, at your houses with blindfolds and handcuffs, what would you do with me? Wait, wrong group. Shit. Did I press enter on this shit? Well, guess what, Phil? We are going to answer this anyways. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'd be bringing you inside and giving you one good time. That's what I'd be doing, Phil. Anytime, Phil. You're welcome. Oh, and trust me, Phil, if you came in with blindfolds and handcuffs, I'd be having you handcuff and blindfold me and I'd give you the smoke show lifestyle. 
like neither one of us are lying phil either like we're totally down for what you're suggesting like <laughs> this isn't even like we're doing it for the show call us sometime yeah, call me <laughs> <laughs> all um, right well, how was his unserious question that, all right so the next question is he goes real question is how would you survive if you had to live out an attack from your favorite horror verse baddie does not count saying you would probably be killed he 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 yeah, I want I the, say. He he's like i want the keys to be in the final girl and the final smoke show <laughs> mm. um so yeah me i'm uh, for being the final smoke show if i can't if i can't just say i'd die right away i would probably since uh jason is like my favorite baddie from the world like in slasher form uh, i the only thing i could think of is just try to hide and outsmart jason because Jason's not very smart, but I mean, he knows the woods and I would just do my best to just constantly sneak around and avoid or try to distract him and get away. Yeah. You know what? As much as we joke that you and I would die because we say that all the time, I actually don't think we would in a real slasher film. I think if we did, it would be like a tragic loss character because I do think we're intelligent enough to A, not get into that situation in the first place. And B, um, I think we could manage to survive if we needed to. But I guess for me, it would be Freddy. Like, we might as well just do that because it's Friday Nightmares. And yeah, um, makes sense. I chose the Nightmares piece. So I think for me, I would probably try to, you know, hone my inner Alice and try to fight back within my dreams and take control over your dreams, which you can't do. Um, you know, I always have liked the concept that Freddy's a boogeyman that if you don't believe in, he can't hurt you. Um, and I would try to kind of use my wits to outsmart him, um, and try to survive it that way. If I was in a slasher like Scott, I would do the same thing Scott recommended. I would try to outsmart and try to just, I think the biggest thing that people do in horror movies who survive compared to those who don't is they try to calm themselves and think of ways to handle the situation, which I can do. And yep. I have had to do in, you know, I have been in life or death situations before right? and I have been able to survive them. So I think that that's the biggest thing that I would pull from is, you know, evaluating my options as quickly as I could. And which one do I think is going to be the most successful? Um, and, you know, like, like all joking aside, you can be completely hammered, but you can sober up real quick if you have to kind of survive something. So I, yeah. I think there's that possibility there as well. Yeah, great. I like it. Yeah. Uh, then we get a question from our good old pal Donna Nelly uh, nice. from the Fresh Cuts. Uh, Mr. Donna Nelly asks one for each of you. Scott, what scenario would you want to see if you were given control to create a new Gremlins film? Heather, how drunk would you have to be to watch the movie Scott just made up? So no matter I will what answer... Scott makes up, there's not enough alcohol in the world. <laughs> Done. That's the answer. All right. So I'll give my answer then. Uh, I would actually go with a continuation, like a straight continuation of part two. I would. <sighs> of course you would. Well, I would. This is where I was going to say I will. I would cut out a lot of the ridiculous Looney Tunes mm -hmm. comedy. But I, what, what I would like to see happen is since at the end of part two, you see Greta the Gremlin is still alive. I would like to see her like getting out into New York City and then it rains and then creates a shit ton more gremlins. This time, obviously, without any genetic manipulation and all this stuff and just kind of go back to what the first film was. Just a shit ton of gremlins causing havoc in a major city. Um, and I would probably make it a little more, try to even make it a little more horror than the first film. Because the first film had some horror elements, but, you know, was still just kind of off the wall silly. I would like to see it like, yeah, I would like to see what would have happened if the Gremlins actually did get out in New York, but actually be a lot more horrific and then just causing mischief and hurting people. And then, you know, since Billy and uh, Gizmo are still in New York, they would have to come together to try to stop what is just happening again. Awesome. Okay. I just yeah. need a lot of alcohol because it sounds <laughs> torturous. Um, I used to not, just so I'm clear, I used to not hate gremlins, but I'm not a big puppet person to begin with. Um, but Scott's weird fucking obsession, like he's like the tad of working out with gremlins and it ruined it for me and it continues to. So when you asked about drinking, Don, like probably to the point where I would die from alcohol poisoning. And then I would come <laughs> back as a ghost to haunt Scott and push all his gremlin characters off his shelves repeatedly just to get back at him, especially if he had a date over. 
then I would really fuck up shit around the house. I would throw things <laughs> just to get revenge. Oh, I love you. <laughs> I know. I'm the uh, best. And Don, that was a great question. Yes, as soon thank as I, you, Don. And as soon as I seen that uh, question for you specifically, Heather, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be great. <laughs> you know what? Don's really cool, actually. Don oh, can say is. anything and it's fine because he really is one of the coolest podcasters in this community. He just merges he really is. Of his own drama and I fucking dig the shit out of that. I right? love it. I love right? him. Um, so this one's going to be a, uh, from our good old buddy, good old buddy, Craig Wooten. Uh, oh, Craig. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions from him. We'll try to just kind of shoot through these real fast. Um, this one, I think, is directed towards me because I am in a, where I met Craig, I'm in a Facebook group called Talking Films. I think I have added Heather to the group as well. But uh, this one, I think, is directed to me for something recently. But he said, why are you so wrong about the Wrong Turn remake or the movies, the original? Because he loves the original film and wasn't the biggest fan of the remake, where I liked the remake more than the original. And I just have bad taste, Craig. That's why. That's why I'm wrong. But no, in all seriousness, I find the Wrong Turn films to just be the originals to be just okay. They are basically just a concept of Hills Have Eyes meets Friday the 13th nothing original there and i even though the remake is more woke i would say it's still like a completely different concept that i really kind of just dug yeah i think the remake was i i just think it was more modernized it yeah. wasn't really and you know what it was a reimagining like it really isn't anything compared to the original one the original one was a basic fucking 2000 slasher and they yeah. were just pumping that shit out because they were using hot tv tv stars at the time yeah, I don't I don't even think they should be compared in the same camp. I know we compared them in the same camp, but they really shouldn't be because they're yeah. such different fucking films. Um, but yeah, another one that he asks is what horror directors or director slash directors has influenced your taste the most? Um, for me, it would be John Carpenter and Stuart Gordon. Uh, John Carpenter, just because of his filming style and a lot of his films are some of my all time favorite movies in general, like The Thing. Uh, Escape from New York, Halloween, like I could go on with his filmography and Stuart Gordon, because uh, he does these very quirky, but fun horror films and has in and he's the one that made me fall in love with Lovecraft because Stuart Gordon did a lot of Lovecraft based stories like Reanimator, From Beyond, Dagon, stuff like that. Yeah, for me, it's Wes Craven. I think Wes Craven has uh, or did uh, uh, energize the horror community. I think with the creation of Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, followed up with Scream, probably his two best known, and well, the people under the stairs as well. Um, I think he he just really knew how to deliver a good storytelling. Uh, he knew how to direct a film. He knew how to be modern and bring li breathe life into a genre. And even with the Freddy Nightmare on Elm, Elm Street series, uh, when he came back with a new nightmare, I think that a new nightmare is ahead of its time when it yeah. was and um, I think it was brilliant to bridge that world between reality and, and fantasy. Um, and then finally, Jordan, Jordan Peele. Uh, I think Jordan Peele has an ability to capture current society, societal factors while making an entertaining film. I think he interjects appropriate comedy into his films. I do think his films are political with not being overly political. If you find them overly political, I question how aware you are of issues that exist in North America today. Um, and that's my own personal belief. And too bad if you don't like it, the question's for me. So um, <laughs> yeah, for me, it's Jordan Peele for sure as, as a modern director. Nice. Um, now the next question, this one's going to take a second, I think for both of us. Well, maybe not, but we'll see. What horror film do you think deserves a remake slash reboot or what series deserves a requel, reboot sequel, a la Halloween, Candyman, etc.? Oh, for me, it's Cujo. I've said this for years. Oh, yeah. I think the original Cujo film, though I appreciate the acting by many of the characters in that film, and I love the St. Bernard doggy because you don't look them fluffy. Um, I think that movie deserves a remake. And I think my opening screen shot of the woman running for the car, the mother running for the car and this hearing the breathing in the background and the dog, and she's trying to shut the door and the dog's trying to break in. And we go back and forth between present day and the past that led to that would be a much better film. I 110% believe that if I had the money and the ability to write a script and do that, I 100% would. 
And that's kind of uh, funny because I also have chosen a Stephen King one. Oh, which um, one? I am going with The Stand. Like they mm. they recently came out with a Stand mini the Stand miniseries, but I want to see a readaptation of this done well because like they both the original miniseries back in like the '90s and the one that just came out seem to miss a lot of like the character development that is in the King book. This would have to be like an ongoing multiple movie series because it just has to be that way because it's such a huge, massive book. But I think the characters in that need to be looked into a little more, the psyche of each character, because there is a lot of characters in that because of, you know, what happens. And yeah. I think with everything that's happened nowadays with the pandemic, I think if they decided to like make a very serious story about this and how people reacted, like if they showed like what happened when this disease got free of the military compound, like I think it would add for like a much more tense story. Cool. Um, then he asks, favorite A24 film? Uh, for uh, me, I got to say Midsummer just because of the whole uh, being in a toxic relationship and the dealing of anxiety, like the way it is portrayed in this film. This film hit me so hard emotionally. Like I, yeah, I, I, this is just automatically the one I came up when I thought of this. For me, it would be false positive. Oh, nice. I think false positive is one of the most um, honest looks at, um, a female's experience with being pregnant, looking, seeking fertility assistance, uh, and the outcomes of that, and how you're treated as a pregnant woman, and the expectations behind motherhood in our North American society. Um, so yeah, that's for me. Nice. Uh, that's a very good one too, because that yeah. movie's great. Um, what up and coming horror filmmaker should you have or should have more acclaim and a bigger budget? Mm. Uh, I'm gonna think because I got to look up the director's name. I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. Well, I think we've seen a couple of really good up and coming films, and probably one that you know that was directed that we both shouted out was Sean King O'Grady, who did the movie We Need to Do Something. Yes. I oh, think that, that is, is an one. example of somebody who was able to work with a very minimal budget and pull out a really good film. This gentleman's only directed two films, Land Grab and this one, um, the one that I just mentioned. And I think he is one to watch out for. I also think the person who directed The Sound of Violence, Alex uh, Nori, was that was an exceptional movie as well. I think the directing behind that movie was great. And that person has only directed two movies, The Conductor, which came out in 2018, which was a seven minute film, which was about a music engineering, music engineer, mm. and then The Sound of Violence. So I think that those are two examples of directors who have come out with some awesome indie films this year, who I hope to see more of moving forward. Yeah, I, I completely agree with those. And I will bring up one more um, from like, this one, just because you know my love for it. But uh, Jeremy Gardner, the director of After yes. Midnight and The Battery. He has a little bit more clout to him than these two other ones that we just mentioned. But another one who honestly, and he acts in his own films, doesn't he? Yes, both films. Yeah, he was, he was in both. And I think that's someone who has a lot of talent when you can do all of that very, very well. Yeah, he is one that covers relationships and character development in such an incredible way absolutely very well and done. i would love to see what else he can do yeah. um and then there are two more from craig are there any horror novels you'd like to see adapted to film um me i would like to see the sequel book uh, the sequel to john dies at the end which is uh don't open this book or shit can't remember oh, the name of I, it i get it's, it's confused okay this book is full of spiders seriously don't open it and it's the sequel to John Dies at the End. And it is basically a continuation of that mo that book. And what the, that was a movie as well. But it is just so batshit insane and scary because these like parasitic spiders enter people's throats and start controlling them and their limbs get like, they can turn their limbs into blades and like, they it just becomes horrific. But it's also ridiculous and stupid because it's John and Dave from John Dies at the End, which I don't know if you've seen that movie. No, I haven't Never. seen it. No. Oh, it's insanely ridiculous making you go what the fuck the entire time because it's so silly and over the top and i would love to see the sequel book being re uh, adapted to the big screen yeah very good suggestion for me is joyland i've said this before oh yep uh joyland which was written in 2013 by stephen king about based on an amusement park i would love to see that made into a film 
I think it'd be really an excellent, well done horror film. Nice. And then uh, for me, uh, or for the last question from Craig, the obligatory Ari Aster, Robert Eggers, or Jordan Peele question. Um, for me, it's Ari Aster. I, I pretty much love everything Ari Aster has done. He has done such a great job of character development and showing what real grief looks like. And like, I am very excited. Like he is like one of those directors that just hasn't done wrong yet for me. And I am so excited to see what he does next. You know, I think all of those directors are awesome. Whether I care for all the films or not is irrelevant. Their abilities to direct and command the setting like i didn't love the lighthouse i i made no you know i won't say it's a shitty movie because it's not i think that's a really immature stance to take it just wasn't for me um right. it was a little too slow but i appreciate the ability to direct and put focus in on that film which is robert edgar's right right and i think addy astor's midsummer yet again not my preference of movie that i will go to but his ability to pull such emotion from Florence Pugh and other characters in there, phenomenal. But of course, it's going to be Jordan Peele for me. Yeah. Um, and that's because of my own personal interest in what he talks about. I love the humor that he interjects into his films. And I just love the social political messages behind it. And I know that the other two do include social political messages in their film to a certain extent. Um, I am the pretty thing that lives in the walls. So that's by Robert Eggers, right? Now, that is... Uh... Osgood Perkins. Osgood Perkins. So anyway, that's interesting that we didn't include him in here because he yeah. is a really interesting director as well. But I, for me, it's going to be Peel. Yep, I knew that answer right away for you because yeah. I know you're. I know how much Peel means to you. But at the same time, like that's a personal preference. I yeah. think these two other directors, like I'm, I do another podcast called The Slumber Party Massacre, and we did a debate about these directors, and they're all good. You know, yeah. like to to put one above the other, I don't think is a fair statement because really. I think it's going to depend on what your preference is for filmmaking, how you enjoy watching films, what you want out of your films. And for me, it's Peel, but I could totally respect if someone, like I respect Scott's opinion on who he prefers. Like to me, it's, I would never, like Scott and I are never going to get into a debate about these three directors because they're all good. Yeah, we'd have nothing bad to say about them. It's just (laughs) personal preference. Right. And, and it's going to come down to what you connect with more, but objectively they all do their job as a director extremely fucking well. Yep. Um, and that's what we have going on. And this is where people who like, no, oh, the 80s were the best time for her because that's when John Carpenter and with Fabian and other people made films. Yes, the 80s were great. Don't get me wrong. But there's lots of great modern horror. And if you're saying there isn't, then in my opinion, you're not watching the variety that's out there. Yeah, Both Scott exactly. and I are at 151 what, 2021 watches for me. How many are you at, Scotty? I'm at 125. So like over 100 movies Scott and I have watched. Yeah. And we can tell you that there's something out there for everybody and there's different genres and there's different types of films that you can enjoy. So, you know, check out these directors. If you, for some reason, think modern horror sucks, you probably aren't listening to this podcast if you do, because, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but if for some reason, you know, someone who does encourage them to check out these directors because they're great. Yep. Completely agree. Uh, we have one final question and this is from our, from my buddy, Justin Bramlett. <laughs> All right. So we went from serious questions to cap it off with a silly question. Nice. How many times do you jerk off slash masturbate at a a day? I'm at about 10 to 20. (laughs) Oh, Um, man, I wish I was at 10 to 20. (laughs) I would say I'm about a one to two a day guy. (laughs) Um, Depends on the day, Justin. Wow. (laughs) Does Justin have a partner? Uh, Yes, he does. (laughs) Okay. Um, That's too bad um so yeah i think it depends on the day justin like i don't know now you got like that's a question i really care about i know you um do. <laughs> yeah i would say some days it's up to three wow. other days it's zero you know it just all depends justin how i'm feeling um but if you do 10 to 20 you're a fucking champ and whoever your partner <laughs> is i don't know either needs to start putting out more like you guys need to connect a little bit more or maybe you just do that and do them and and that's the case you're superhuman <laughs> right like, and, and knowing Justin, he is superhuman. Like, wow. <laughs> That's impressive. I feel like we should have Justin on the show just so we talked about that. <laughs> where did oh, you Justin great. from? Uh, I uh, went to high school with him. Oh, good. Guess where he's coming on the show then. <laughs> hey, does he, he listen? Well, 
Uh, I don't know if he listens, but he is the uh, the main admin of the Talking Films group. So he is a person that watches a shit ton of movies. Well, guess what you're watching when you come on here, Justin? <laughs> Porn. Right, talking about your 10 to 20 times a day. I'm super <laughs> impressed. Did he think that question would make us uncomfortable? No, I think he was just being a jackass and just thought it'd be funny. Oh, man, now he, pro- made- he probably didn't expect me to read it on the air. But He's made a mistake. <laughs> if, if, if he... If he didn't think I was going to read it on the air, he doesn't know me well enough. Oh, he didn't think we were going to answer it and then try to bring him on to talk about it. He doesn't know either one of us well. He always <laughs> doesn't listen to this show. Uh, but yeah, that is the end of all of our questions. But So thank you guys for all these great questions. They were all fun and very thoughtful. Greatly yeah, appreciate taking the time. to include anything. I didn't think we were going to get any questions. I didn't think anyone cared. Um, I always think like no one cares. And like Scott always proves me wrong. People do care. Yep, I'll say some actually care because they listen to the show. Some may not listen to the show, but throw us some silly questions just for the hell of it, which makes it even more fun. Well, you know, and that's that's what we're all about here on Friday Nightmares. <laughs> that's right. We're times. all we're all about those good times, baby. <laughs> because yeah. we don't know a lot. Oh, though these questions allowed us to show that we do know shit about horror movies. We can really right. talk about upcoming <laughs> directors. Um, you know, it showed that we do have some some chops to ourselves and our opinions and views which i got into a debate on facebook yesterday about uh someone comparing terrifier to james wan's new film and how oh, I'm malignant. you like terrifier you're not gonna like this film and how that makes absolutely zero sense um <laughs> like it, like films go into categories you know like you're gonna like dumb slashers like what terrifier is and you're gonna like slow burns like people have the ability to like different films and just because someone doesn't like a film, you shouldn't get overly upset about it. I've read where people think us is the biggest piece of shit or, oh my God, I walked out of Candyman because it was so bad and so political. Right. And like, I think about responding and then I'm like, why bother? You know, if they really think it was a big piece of poo poo and they want to like say that, that's fine. You know, but that that movie was one of the highest grossing films this summer for yeah. horror. And has, I think, been one of the best selling films or best grossing films for a Black director. And yes, everyone, it does matter that she's a Black female director. Oh, because absolutely Because that has does. been a, mar- a marginalized group. That's why they're acknowledging it. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, we just got a woman president at our university, and it is the first time in the history of our university that we have had a woman leader. That's a big deal. It's a big deal for women, you know, yeah. to be moved into a place of leadership. But um, yeah, people always just, and that's okay. You can have your opinion and stuff, but I just, I hate it when people start slagging others' taste. Like I tease you, Scott, about yeah, I gremlins and stuff, but I actually don't think you have bad taste. I would never do a show with you or spend time with you if I really thought that you were, you know, didn't have a good taste in anything. Why would I, why would I want to do a show with you? Um, right to be a constant arguing then yeah and which you know some people dig a lot of people do dig that but like i i just and i just think it's immature to (laughs) criticize what someone really likes i i really do like there's films that have come out like saint maud that i'm not a huge fan of i know certain people love that film well made well acted just didn't do it for me right same you know and that doesn't mean that it's a shitty film it just means that it wasn't it just yeah. wasn't for me, right? Exactly. And I just, I find this attitude of like, I don't know. It's just immature. And I just don't have fucking time for it, honestly. Yeah, I agree. So, but that's Scott and I's, you know, two cents of <laughs> what we think people should think and not think, which wasn't even a question. I just decided to add it on here. <laughs> so Heather does what she wants. Ah, I, I smoke, I drink, I do drugs, I do what I want. <laughs> Whatever, I do what I want. <laughs> we have side. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you everyone for listening as always. We will be back again in two weeks with our next episode, uh, which will be super brilliant, whatever we do. I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about it when Scott's here in person. Yeah, I was saying, hopefully we'll have some very fun stories of us getting together. We should probably literally do some show planning in person. This <laughs> we should like really map out maybe the next couple of months. I mean, why not? We're going to be together. <laughs> mean like do like we did back in the day driving to niagara falls like you could have a little notebook and we could talk on the drive yeah i could i am totally down for that like we probably should actually take some breath yeah (laughs) maybe do some planning out (laughs) so we're not like all right what are we gonna do next week (laughs) right a week before we record (laughs) right maybe that would be a good idea so hopefully when y'all see us next it will be when we go live please please feel free to interact with us 
and ask us anything. There's no, we don't care. We got nothing to hide. We're pretty open. No. Yeah, we are open. We are an open book for sure. And I open, whether you like us to be an open book or not, we, we yep. are. <laughs> that's, that's how we are. <laughs> so Scotty, until next time, what do you have to say to the nice people? Until next time, whatever you do, when you go to your vacation home or your Airbnb, make sure the doors are locked. And if there's some crazy super host, get the fuck out of that place and go get a hotel. And until next time, unpleasant dreams. See ya.